Uh, welcome to everyone that's just joining. Uh, and also, welcome to everyone who is joining at some later date through uh, the recorded videos uh, uploaded here, or eventually, I guess, they'll be uploaded to YouTube as well. Um, good morning to everyone. It's such a nice lighting in here, right? I love the camera right now. Um, so I guess it's day four of the stream, and um, I finally have my dog Jamu back today. Uh, I'll show you him right now before I get started. He won't like me disturbing his sleep. But what are you going to do? Here he is. <laughs> He's like, why are you waking me up? So there he is um, for anyone who is already on and um, which is nobody so far as I see and uh, one sec but also my stream hasn't even registered like anything yet it hasn't even registered me being on for some reason um, so yeah that's Jamal finally have him back today and um, yeah I guess like like I've been doing every day, I just want to kind of like uh, do some sort of reflections like before I get started on like what I was, how it's been for me, um, what I've been thinking uh, about the stream since I stopped streaming. Um, and the reason for that, I guess, is just so it's a record for me, but also, um, and I think it's probably just something that I want to do like as part of being in community with the people that are watching, um, whoever is watching, that's the second reason. Um, so we can kind of get on the same, like you can kind of know how I'm feeling, just like we're trying to get to know how Saeed's feeling in this um, thing. And you can understand my own readings better because all my readings of him are subjective, even though I spend so much time doing it, it's all my own interpretation of it. Um, and, uh, but also that's always like ingrained in like how I feel, um, my ideas about the world, et cetera, et cetera. Like I feel like, billion people if a billion people read the same sentence that i did we would have like half a billion different interpretations of it or something and all those half a billion i would have never thought of before in my life and so um that's to say i like to do these updates just because it kind of teaches you as someone who's listening to me read how i feel and then you can kind of do the same sort of thing in your mind with me <laughs> where you can be like oh he's kind of saying that because he thinks in this way or whatever um, but that's to say, uh, it's the fourth day I'm doing it, and I am, uh, feeling like it's very, like, become very central in my life, probably because I do it for five hours a day, and it's, like, very intense brain work. Um, it's, like, very intense. So I feel like my I feel like I've lived, like, a thousand years since I started this stream, honestly. Um... And it's not even about like viewership or whatever. It's just like the fact that I'm putting so much time into the project and so much energy into the project. It's making me feel that way. But also I feel like I'm changing a lot. Um, I feel like I'm transforming like so intensely, um, both in terms of like how I am understanding the world already from spending this much time with Saeed, um, but also just in how I'm understanding the book. Um, and last night I literally dreamed I was streaming <laughs> like all night so that was an issue for me because i was like i need a break from this <laughs> i need to get out of this in my dreams <laughs> so that's that uh and for anyone watching this who um has any interest in doing it i would say like because um one of my so as you can see Tommy Halal Salami, who, who is my most recent follower, 13 hours ago, um, is someone that I, I've never met, but I know on Twitter um, from that capacity. And uh, they were also like, I had this idea. And then like a week later, they hit me and they were like, I have this idea. <laughs> and I was like, wow. <laughs> so like, that was like a big part of the reason why I thought it might be a good idea because I'm like, okay, so different people from different um, areas uh, of the world and different life experiences are kind of having the same idea. So that's to say that if folks are watching this and you feel like, um, like trying it out, I would say totally go for it. Like I said at the beginning of yesterday, um, my, my dream is that this is like a new area of Twitch. Like, and it won't just be like 
like like academic rejects like me you know like it'll be uh people who who have very wide readerships um and it'll be a way for them to kind of put their money where their mouth is so to speak but maybe put their mouth where their money is in a different sense um but uh just it'll, it can be a way for people to for uh thinkers to be held accountable to the public that they act like they're accountable to uh, toward um as teachers and as teachers like in a certain holistic sense not just as teachers uh not just as missionaries of their own work um of their own thought and so that's to say that i think as is the case with something like this it might start from the opposite direction it might start from people uh who have uh i guess less to lose um less investment less tangled up in it um but that's to say that if anyone is interested in doing something like this i would really encourage it please reach out to me um and i'm really happy to uh basically just help you out in any way or to show you in any way i didn't know what to expect when i started it because i know i had never seen it but and it was kind of weird the first day but it felt really natural really quick so computer caveman literature reviewing and tuning in here and there yay good luck on your literature review review today computer caveman i hope that you finish it today um prospectus work is intense <laughs> is that a tornado a whirlwind <laughs> yeah if that whirlwind is symbolic in the way that i'm thinking of it as then uh it's a whirlwind for sure uh, and really good luck and i really feel honored to spend time with you today in this way um and so yeah that's i was just talking about that if anyone feels like doing something like this please do it um i think it's time that we start taking our thought outside of the academy and there's ways in which the academy makes it a closed door conversation both in the way that we learn to speak and also in the way that we're speaking and also on the things that we're speaking about. So it's all in these different ways. Um, and so that's just, that's that. Um, some A few more reflections. And I think this is just an important thing too because I feel like from what I understand, like when I am a, as a Twitch follower myself, like I get a notification that somebody's streaming that I like and I'm doing some other shit and then it takes me like a few minutes to like put it on if I'm gonna put it on. So this is just like a, I guess an intro thing. Um, as I'm starting to, um, just sharing my reflections still. Um, I think I'm really liking this because it's, and I was talking to a, my best friend about this earlier. Um, it's something that I wanted actually. Um, and I still want, <laughs> so that's another reason I'm saying other people should try to check it out. Try, try, try it out if you want, because it's really something that I want, um, a way to kind of put something on in the background that just um, is a way of practicing um, being together, um, being with our ancestors especially, um, practicing listening, and just kind of thinking about ethics in a way that's not like essentially white. Um, and, and so that's what I kind of realized yesterday um, when I was reading this and I was talking about um, what Said has taught me about my dog and my relationship with him. And I was just like, okay, so... Said is really like teaching me like his ideas about how to be an ethical person in the world, and um, and, it's, and I and I get to share that here now, and um, it's really nice in that way um, for me. So I'm enjoying it a lot. Um, and I had one more thing to say, but I can't really remember. Oh, so I guess I'll just go over like what we did yesterday, and then I'll start. Um, and so for folks just tuning in, as I'm finishing my reflection now. This is a stream uh, where I am basically practicing slow reading um, uh, anti-Zionist and or abolitionist theory. There's things that are not mutually exclusive in any way. Uh, and I'm doing that as a practice in being with those people, as a practice in listening to the people that are writing this, um, as a practice in focusing um, myself, uh, my values, um, sharpening my uh, kind of ability to uh, navigate the shit that they're talking about, right? Um, so it's that it's all a practice in all of that, um, and it's also a practice in trying to uh, find a way. And this was how this came for me. And so I'll just say it over again. Like for me, this sort of reading practice that I developed came out of me like truly loving reading and learning, but in the academy 
realizing that what was kind of being beat out of me was uh, the f idea that reading could be fun and it could be ethical. It could be something that I could be doing for an important reason. And so for me, like this reading, this reading um, practice kind of just developed for me as a, a way of just m keeping reading fun and an uh, ethical thing. And um, I really believe that if you slow down and you kind of, and so, and so the reason why I kind of started feeling that way when I was reflecting, like, why do I feel this way about it? Um, I started realizing that so much of the logic of how we learn to read is like so deeply capitalist and so deeply um, entrenched in these carceral ideas. Um, and so what I mean by that is on the one, um, for the, in the first case, um, we learn to read in order to extract something from the reading or in order to uh, gain, uh, gain something from the reading or in order to sort of uh, develop some products from the reading. And so I'm really interested in the possibility of reading just as a practice without a goal in mind, without um, a product in mind. Um, just reading as a practice of being with that person, and that's what I mean by that. And what I mean by a sort of carceral way of reading is that we read in a way in which we want to be able to have a summary of what we've read. We want to be able to contain it, right? To be able to have a sort of neatly wrapped idea of what we read so that we can just share it with other people. I don't know, like we can feel like we, we've known it, we've mastered the text or something, right? Like, like even um, Computer Cavemen said that uh, they're doing their literature review right now. One of the things that was so disturbing to me about this prospectus process in my PhD, which some people who are watching me might be going through, some people who are watching me might not be going through, but basically so the prospectus process in the PhD is like, you have to like, you have to like declare a project and uh, that's gonna be like the thing that you're gonna write as your like dissertation at the end of the PhD. Computer Caveman says death. <laughs> yeah. So you have to declare this project and you have to like submit a proposal for it. And part of the proposal is showing like that you have mastered all of these fields in those words. And for me, that's just like so ridiculous. Like, first of all, in the idea of a field, which we've been talking about for maybe 15 hours now and how Saeed is really like militating against that idea, right? And also transcending that idea in a particular way but also in the idea of mastery. So what does it mean to read without having a desire to master the text, but just having a desire to be with the person who's speaking to you and speaking with you in this moment? Um, yeah, and so that's kind of the, that's kind of like a, the kind of imperative behind um, a channel like this. Uh, and yeah, so that's that. Um, so yesterday we got to the end of the series of qualifications that he made, um, that Said made. And so, basically, uh, so far, in the first section of the introduction, um, Said has sort of uh, started by introducing Orientalism in the context and trying to introduce uh, his critique of Orientalism against this entire fucking world literally actually literally against the whole world because what he's trying to do is to introduce it to you but the thing that he's critiquing literally informs every fiber of how you're even engaging with what he's critiquing right so he's trying to introduce this thing called orientalism to you but this thing called orientalism for him coheres ideas of history and time and politics and everything that makes a world a world and so he has to kind of it is sort of doing that, but if he's going to do this in any responsible way, and it's clear he cares about it so much, he has to um, be always teaching you how to read him as he's reading him, right? And so the first thing in the first section, from what I'm from my reading, what we went over, um, and you can find if you're just tuning in right now, you can find my discussions of the first section um, in my first two streams, and um, they're like five hours each, so you don't have to like, it's, it's not, it's never something that I feel like you have to just like listen to like that, like you have to like pay attention to, but when I engage with streams, I just put it on in the background, I do my own thing, that's how I kind of engage with Twitch streams, but I'm going to try to recapitulate things as much as possible, both because I think it's important for me as a reading practice, obviously I'm the most present one um, by definition because I'm reading, but it's still important for me, but also just for folks who are tuning in um, for the first time in this stream. Um, and one thing that I noticed yesterday was that I was getting really into it and um, 
and I, and I, I think I felt that later the first day, I slowed down the second day, and the third day I got too into it again, and I get, this, my pace increases, and I, I'm less careful and more exhausted. And in my opinion, if I'm doing this right, I shouldn't be tired at all. It should just be me having fun. Um, so um, that's to say I'm trying to slow down. Um, and I just realized I'm getting caught up again. <laughs> but uh, so in for me, what I read is that what I read in the first part is he's trying to introduce this concept called Orientalism to us. Right? Said is. But in order to do that, he has to sort of do that in a way that we're not assimilating it back into our ideas of history and of time, etc. So he starts trying to introduce what Orientalism is to us. And the best way he can do that is by just thinking of the most banal everyday example to show us how it's so interwoven into the fiber of our everyday life. It's the most visible in a place where we would literally never think to look for it. Right? So he starts with this simple observation by this journalist in Beirut. Right? But then he sort of starts um, in the first section the way he has to um, extrapolate that that discussion is by showing us um, how this is working in conjunction with an idea of time and history that we already have. And so what he does is he introduces what Orientalism sort of, the stakes of what Orientalism is, right? And then he kind of says, for people that are engaging this sort of work now, which is now being in 1975, you might have to have a different uh, idea or understanding of what this thing called Orientalism is. And that's not because your idea is wrong, but it's actually because this difference is paradigmatic of the thing that I'm talking about. And what I mean by that is any um, period of manifestations of Orientalism, which creates the impression of like a certain time period or a certain conditions or a certain reality, is always a divergence in some way uh, from what Orientalism is in itself. So, for example, the example he gives uh, in this case is the most obvious example he gives in this case, which is so deeply tied into the whole concept of Orientalism, right? Is that if America, if, if right now, right now being 1975, um, in 1975, if you're engaging with this with his work on Orientalism, you're gonna think when you think Orient, you're gonna think Far East. That's what he's saying, and that's because an American imperialist idea of Orient, um, that diversion, that divergence from an I from the idea of what Orientalism is in itself, has actually like uh, is actually what's manifesting reality in this moment, right? But if you kind of pay attention, you see that this actually is a deviation from what Orientalism has been in its longer tradition, right? So he introduced, so in the first, um, in the first section of the book, he introduces, in the, my reading, he introduces uh, the concept of Orientalism, and then he has to say, but wait, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one relationship with what, you, with what the reality that you understand, because it's something that's defining reality actively all the time according to different circumstances. So it's a step back from that, right? So there's this idea of what Orientalism is in its manifestations in 1975 versus what Orientalism is in itself. And so he's kind of juggling those two. And then from those two, an Orient, an Orient, uh, an Orientalism of it in, in manifestation form and an Orientalism in a more latent, uh, in itself kind of form. He kind of, uh, he spells those two out in a set of three definitions, right? So the first one in his, what he calls, what I'm, what I'm calling now a sort of manifestation of Orientalism, he calls an academic definition of Orientalism. And as we learn later, um, which we went over at the end of yesterday's stream, what he means by academic is this is the, um, the definition that is being uh, processed into an idea of truth right now. Right, because for him, the academy is sort of the place where subjective ideas get hardened into ideas that are truth claims. Right, um, and so his first definition then, according with this sort of juggling that he's doing between a certain period of manifestations in 1975 versus Orientalism in itself, is uh, the the Orient. Uh, anyone who teaches, writes about, or researches the Orient is an Orientalist. 
And what we discussed last time is that the about is sort of the pivot point of that sentence, right? Because if you're going to be able to talk about something objectively, you have to have a certain distance from it. And you have to obviously be dis disavowing some part of it. You can never be fully descriptive of something, right? And then so he tries to offer a definition of Orientalism in itself, which is what he says is a style of thought based upon an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and most of the time the Occident. And he clarifies that by saying, thus a large mass of writers have accepted the basic distinction between East and West as the starting point for elaborate theory. And what, something we talked about that is in relation to kind of the way that I've been summarizing it now, is that the have accepted, the passiveness of that, is what we should be paying attention to in this definition. Because you see that Orientalism can be found in the things that you've already accepted, that you have learned to, that you didn't have to think about. And you don't even realize you didn't have to think about it, because that's why, that's by definition what it is. So all the things that have just um, kind of like, like smuggled themselves into your understanding of the world as things that you didn't have to question, or as things that are just reality. And we're kind of realizing this on infinite terrains all the time, right? If you follow those back, if, you, if you're constantly practicing, unsettling everything that you have just learned to accept, you'll see that there's a pattern in what you have been, in the things that have been purporting themselves to be objective reality, and that pattern is what he's calling Orientalism, right, in itself. And then he gives us a third definition in this set of in this set of definitions, which is sort of a third time period period of manifestations that he's talking about. It's not distinct from the first one, um, 1975, but it's since the late 18th century, right. And this is sort of a co where the colonial apparatus of Orientalism takes hold. Right? And that's what he's interested in talking about, when the colonial apparatus kind of becomes uh, concurrent with Orientalism. right? And so what he's doing in this first section is talking about Orientalism. But if he's going to be talking about Orientalism in any way, then he has to be unsettling your idea of Orientalism as being a thing fixed in time. Because actually Orientalism is the thing that produces the idea that something can be fixed in time. Um, and he ends this first section uh, with a, a kind of statement about the stakes of that, right? And what he's saying, sort what he's saying is this thing called Orientalism, you see, is this cycle of uh, limitation and progression, of approach and retraction. It's a constant, it's an infinity of settlement. Because it's a way of being that is a settler way of being. And so, it's in uh, thinking of it like that, if you look at the approach of Orientalism, at the expansion of Orientalism, at the time, at the late 18th century, when France and Britain approached the Orient, I mean, this is right here, then you can start to understand the way that our idea of reality is shifting concurrent with how America right now is approaching the Orient. So the stakes of this, in the wake of 67, uh, in terms of him being a Palestinian writing this book, is if we learn to uh, be aware of how these oscillations of Orientalism function, we can actually anticipate the way that we are getting caught in it right now, right? As the occupation is sort of taking hold in such a way, right? And we have to think, I mean, now we're about 50 years later after this book. So a question now as we're reading this that's always sort of, and Said is now our ancestor, he's no longer with us. Um, so a question now to be able to clarify this, right? So a question now that we have is how, what, at what place in these oscillations are we in now, right? But what you can really start doing with this sort of information, in my opinion, and I kind of touched on this yesterday, is to really see how to not get caught up in the politics of the world or in the world as politics, right? And what I mean by that is when you really understand how this cycle of limitation and expansion, limitation and expansion is sort of an oscillating thing that produces something called a world, that's always reproducing something called a world, you can really start to see that in these like this machinery of society, right? So an example that I... Um, that I uh, uh, thought of yesterday with regard to this was like 
uh, the entire binary between a progressive politic and a conservative politic and how one of them is sort of characterized as a politic of limitation and one of them is characterized as a politic of expansion or of, of expansion, of progression, of change, of whatever. Um, and we will tend to align a radical or an anti-Zionist or an abolitionist politic with the politic of expansion or of progression. We will tend to align it. Like We will tend to assume that a left or a liberal political position is closer to a radical position that we're talking about. Right. But what he's kind of saying is these are actually a push and pull of the same system. Right. Where it's expanding, it's progressing, but the idea of a progression is still caught up in the paradigm um, that is informing it. Right. So it's exp it's progressing along certain terms. And if we really start to question those terms, we can see that those terms are actually fucked up. Right? Or even maybe the idea of being as expansion is fucked up. A settlerness of being. And so that's kind of um, what he says in the first section, in my understanding, and how he ends it. And then in the second section, um, he starts by saying, I have begun with the assumption that the Orient is not an inert fact of nature. And we talked a lot about how um, what he's talking if he's talking about these sort of movements of orientalism then you can really start to see how much even the concept of movement and of, and you can think of movement in uh, in conjunction with the concept of freedom when we think of freedom for me it's so wrapped up in ideas of freedom of movement just as when we think of like unfreedom it's so wrapped up in ideas of uh, carcerality or in other words inertness forced inertness Right. When uh, we can see how these sort of logics get get written into like the way we just learn to think about everything, right? And so the example that I gave yesterday was like, um, I was talking about my dog Jam, and I was saying like, I had just kind of assumed that I don't know. I was surprised when I first like, uh, uh really got to know him that he had like changing interests and like phases of his personality and he would just have changing friendships and shit and i realized that i had assumed a certain inertness on him because i had assumed a hierarchy of being in which i was above him so what that had done is in my head is to make me assume that i had a certain level uh, ability of movement that he didn't have right so i could sort of see this happening in this way but so what he does in this second section is he's spending time making a certain series of qualifications about what he's just said, right? That's almost this whole section so far. We're almost done with the section. We're going to finish it today. We have about two pages left of it. But so far, we've read about halfway through it. And what we've seen so far is that he has made a series of qualifications on what he's just said. And what he's just said is, Therefore, as much as the West itself, the Orient is an idea that has a history and a tradition of thought, imagery, and vocabulary that have given it reality and presence in and for the West. The two geographical entities thus support and to an extent reflect each other. I'm not going to go fully back into these sentences, but if you're really interested in these parts, you can go back into my previous streams. Um, they're all uploaded on, on uh, Twitch right now. Um, and if you're watching this in some point in the far future, they'll be transferred to YouTube. Um, and if you're watching this in a far enough future where I they're not no longer on YouTube, you can email me, and I'll have them somewhere. <laughs> um, but um, that's to say, these qualifications become really interesting, right? So the first qualification he's making is you have to make sure that you unsettle the idea that the idea called Orient encompasses everything that the Orient actually is, right? So you have to. Um, unsettle this implicit assumption that we're taught that uh, the idea or the power or the domination imposed on the Orient has a full capability of, uh, of mastery over it, right? That it can be representative of it, in other words. So, obviously, for him, and he says the word obviously here, that's why I'm using it, obviously, there are, there's a reality 
in this place called Orient that this that the that the anything that can be said about them in the West can never grasp. There's an excess to this, right? Obviously, like everything that this Orient is is not just robots in the image of the West, right? So you have to unsettle this idea that the image has a one-to-one correspondence with reality, that the idea has a one-to-one correspondence with reality, and reality. I'm saying I'm not saying reality in the way that he's critiquing. I'm saying like with everything that it is, right? And then in the second qualification, he takes a step back from there and says, okay, but if you unsettle the idea that the Orient, um, the idea called Orient can fully be descriptive of what this thing that it's referring to actually is, if you unsettle the idea that the representation of the Orient is possible, right? Then you have to also uh, unsettle the idea that the process by which sort of we think of things in this representative way is necess- is natural or necessary also, right? So first you have to unsettle that the idea is universally true. Then you have to understand unsettle the idea that the way that you're approaching the idea that's making it seem universally true is universally true, <laughs> right? If that makes sense. So he's taking a step back from that idea to be like, and this is what he says in the sentence, which I love, to believe that the Orient was created, or as I call it, orientalized. So this is what he's been, this is what he argued in the last qualification. And to believe that such things happen simply as a necessity of the imagination is to be disingenuous. So to believe that this method of apprehending an an image or an idea or an object is the only method, or that is the universal method, That's also something you have to unsettle. So he's taking a step back from what he said to make this qualification. He's making a qualification on his qualification. And that first qualification is a qualification on what he said, right? (laughs) Already in the first section. And then the third qualification is a qualification on that qualification, right? So he's saying, if you believe that the idea called Orient is not universal, and that the method by which you would approach that idea that would make it universal is not universal. You also have to believe then that the paradigm called Orientalism that even informs the possibility of a method called representing something or you know, the methods of let's say capitalist reading that we learn, right? You have to also, you have to take it all the way. So you have to unsettle the idea that that paradigm is universal either. Like, like Orientalism uh, is informing all of this, but it also doesn't have to exist. And we know this because we're talking about this and we're writing this book like this, right? So at every step of the way, Saeed is constantly teaching us how to read him as he's, as he's right, as we're reading him. At every step of the way, it's a very deeply caring pedagogical style of, 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 of communication, of being with someone. Every step of the way, if we're careful and we're listening to him, we're seeing that he's gently reminding us of, the, of how to read the thing that he had just said. And the reason is because he knows how pernicious and how powerful and how deeply entrenched the sort of way of learning that we have is. So every time some new little bit of information enters our minds, we default to reinterpreting it in this fucked up way. And so every time, in just wider and wider arcs and circles, he's going back and uh, reminding us how to read him and how to kind of read, learn, how to kind of learn what he said in a way that's not falling back into the same trap, right? And so he's doing that from qualification to qualification, but he's also doing that from section to section, right? So it's this sort of infinite... Um, circuit of just arcs he's arcing always arcing back in on himself and reteaching you how to read what he said at every level all at the same time it's like a it's for me it's like a genius mode of writing that I can't even begin to approach you know what I mean like it's like wow like the level of like uh, care and attention and the way that these things are woven together for me I can't even begin to approach how something like that is possible to be honest but it's happening, and I can see it happening um, uh, on my in what I'm reading, right? And so what he's done so far is he's made these three qualifications, and each qualification 
is a qualification on the last one. And they're all trying to teach you how to unsettle the naturalizedness of these, this violence that he's, that he's kind of pointing out, right? And another thing that I noticed yesterday that I thought was very interesting, and I don't know what to do with this, but this is like one of my main reflections that I was taking away after yesterday, which is that there's a certain spiritual kind of adherence to these sets, to this number three for him, and these sets of three. And I don't know what that means. I don't know why that is. But what you see is, in the first section, as we talked about, he's juggling kind of three different ideas of Orientalism. Uh, and then in within that, he gives a set of three definitions of Orientalism that aren't necessarily concurrent with those ideas that he's talking about. And then in the second section, he uh, gives three qualifications to start with, right? Of this sort of, uh, of this of 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 this sort of thing, and then, I mean, if we're like, so this is not just me, right? He has three sections of this introduction, and I'm just gonna see if in section three he has three sections of section three. One, sorry, my computer froze. Let's see here. Two. Three. So he has three sections of the third section of this, right? And now on top of that, he has three chapters in this book. Right, and on top of that, this book is the beginning of a trilogy, which is um, Orientalism, Culture, and Imperialism, and Covering Islam. And in my reading, actually, so my computer is um, starting to like really freeze, and I can't tell if it's getting into my stream too. But it looks like I'm frozen on my stream, which is frustrating to me. I'm going to hold on to see what's happening here. Sorry, y'all, if you can still hear me. Okay, it looks like my stream is back on. Well... just a little frustrating um okay so yeah it looks like my stream is back on. honestly i was thinking about this today um i says i have two people in my chat so if you can tell me if if you're in my chat and or if you're viewing right now and you can tell me if i'm freezing or what it'd be really helpful for me to know um or else i won't know until five hours later from now um but i was actually thinking today like uh it's crazy that like my computer is handling this because i have this hella old macbook um, looks like it is working, but yeah, because I have this hella old MacBook, and uh, this is like a free software, a little but not disastrously. Um, okay, cool. So, is it like affecting 
my ability to just be heard? Like, should I, like, you think, thank you, computer caveman. You think I should just quit it and try again? Or is it, you think it's getting better? Or, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I was thinking about this today, though. Nah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was thinking about this today, so I was just like, I can't believe my computer is handling, like, all of this work, <laughs> to be honest, because it is very old and shitty. Um, but, um, anyway, so, I don't know what we missed, but I'll just kind of go over it quickly. I was just nerding out about how there's this seemingly, like, spiritual significance of the number three for Saeed in the way that he is, um, thinking, in the way that he, his thought is structured. And I'm saying that because there's sort of three iterations of Orientalism he's juggling in the first section, and then he's defined independently a set of three definitions of Orientalism in the first section. In the second section, he begins with three qualifications. In the third section, he has three sections of that third section. There's three sections of the introduction in total, three chapters in the book. The book itself is the beginning of a sort of trilogy. Um, Orientalism covering Islam and uh, 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 culture and imperialism. And not only that, but for me, in my kind of understanding of Saeed, uh, this book is actually at the sort of end of a trilogy, um, which is his first three books, which are kind of more, they're critiques of like reality itself. You know, they're not like, they're more um, abstract or meta critiques. And that's his first book, Joseph Conrad and the Fiction of Autobiography. His second book, Beginnings, and this one, Orientalism. But so it's nothing that I'm like trying to psychoanalyze or to like reinscribe re onto him. But it is something that's very, very, very obvious to me, which is that there's a certain way that he thinks in threes. Um, and I don't know what it is about that, but I just think it's interesting. And I and I was just reflecting on like, oh, I realized that after last night. And so now that I've basically like gotten through these few qualifications, I'm gonna keep going. Um, I guess it's been like almost an hour since I've been streaming, um, but it felt good to kind of go back and to have that uh, recapitulation of everything that we've talked about so far. It's helpful for me too to always be kind of t tapped into the movement of the argument. Um, and yeah, so. He, we had just finished last night with this third qualification, right, which I just described as a sort of unsettling the universality of this paradigm called Orientalism, right? And what that meant for him is to kind of uh, break down the border at the edge of that paradigm, right? To unsettle the binary that defines that paradigm, right? And what that means for me, what that meant for him in this case is right here. This brings us to a third qualification. One ought never to assume that the structure of Orientalism is nothing more than a structure of lies or myths which, were the truth about them to be told, would simply blow away. And if that doesn't seem like a good way of saying what I just said he said, he clarifies it later by saying, after all, any system of ideas that can remain unchanged as teachable wisdom from the period of Ernst Renan in the late 1840s until the present in the United States must be something more than formidable than a mere collection of lies. And so in the word mere here, what we can kind of see is what he's talking about is, the re is a regime of value or a system of value that we adopt even if we invert the sort of um, direction of it. And so we're still replicating the same shit. So what he means by that in my reading is it's easy even if we accept the first two qualifications to be like, yeah, and so, fuck all the Orientalists, they're worthless trash, and, like, anything outside of that is important to me. And so it's the value assigned to calling something a lie or a myth versus calling something truth, right? And so what he's saying is when you have this sort of oppositional politic, what you've actually done is you have reinscribed the universality of that thing by way of sharing the borders that it has declared for itself. That's how I read that. And so a much better way to read it, actually, is um, I'm going to look for the book right now so I can find it. Um, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out this line that I, that I said last night, but I want to just keep this PDF open because I think it's great. And we're going to get to this book um, soon, actually. 
um, in this channel. So once I'm done with, um, uh, it's like the third in line. Um, it's the third in line of this. This text is the third in line. So actually what this reminds me of is how Horia Butelja, who um, she just recently came out with this book. Um, she's an activist um, and a thinker and a really brilliant, seemingly amazing person. I've never met her in, based in France. And this book that she wrote that just came out, White Jews and Us Toward a Politics of Revolutionary Love, um, was just translated into English and has been causing a lot of waves. I think it's pr pretty much the most important book that I have that I think has been written in the last few years at least, decade at least. It's an amazing book. It changed my life. I read it all the time. I carry it around and I just read it all the time. Like I just flip to a page every day and I read it. Um, but she says, but this is in the conclusion to the book and this kind of ethic is what, what Sayyid is saying reminds me of. She says, but this cry, Allahu Akbar, terrorizes the vein who see in it a project of decline. So we can see even the word decline here, really speaking with what Sayyid is talking about, right? They are right to fear it, for its egalitarian potential is real, to put men, all men, back in their place without any form of hierarchy. Only one entity is allowed to rule, God. No other entity is granted its power to exercise against one peer, one's peers or against God. Thus, white people take their place alongside all their brothers and sisters in humanity, the place of simple mortals. We might call this a utopia, and it is one, but to re-enchant the world will be a difficult task. I, I, won't, I can keep reading this book forever, but I won't. But that is kind of the ethic that what Said is saying here reminds me of. Um, when Huria Butelja, for example, says... Um, without any form of hierarchy, what I read from what I what, what that reminds me of in Said is what is what he's kind of saying for me in this third qualification is that um, to say that this is all lies and what we have is all truths is to reinscribe a hierarchy if you haven't already unsettled that binary between lie and truths because actually for them this is the truth. There's no and this is sort of the trap in which you, people start thinking the dialogue works right. They think I know the truth, so if I just convince them that it's the truth. That's fine. This is their truth, actually. And so that actually causes a whole other host of problems, right? <laughs> but this is what he's trying to emphasize, right? Where he says, and I'm going to read this line and then continue. Continued investment. Or I'll just actually start one line earlier. Orientalism is not an airy European fantasy about the Orient, but a created body of theory and practice in which for many generations... There has been a considerable material investment. Continued investment made Orientalism as a system of knowledge about the Orient an accepted grid for filtering through the Orient into Western consciousness. Just as that same investment multiplied, indeed made truly productive, the statements proliferating out from Orientalism into the general culture. Gramsci has made the useful analytic distinction between civil and political society in which the former is made up of voluntary, or at least rational and non-coercive, affiliations, like schools, families, unions, the latter of state institutions, the army and the police, the central bureaucracy, whose role in the polity is direct domination. Okay, so, and I'm just going to keep reading, and then I'll go bit by bit. Culture, of course is to be found operating within civil society where the influences of influence of ideas, institutions, and of other persons work not through domination, but what Gramsci calls consent. In any society not totalitarian, then, certain cultural forms predominate over others just as certain ideas are more influential than others. The form of this cultural leadership is what Gramsci has identified as hegemony, an indispensable concept for any understanding of cultural life in the industrial West. It is hegemony, or rather the result of cultural hegemony at work, that gives Orientalism the durability and the strength I have been speaking about so far. Okay. So, what we've seen now is twice this Said, and this is the first thing that I noticed, okay? Twice Said has done the same thing. 
And it's actually very interesting to me. It's like so interesting to me because the way that we are, that we generally will read philosophy or theory or the way that we're taught to write or the way that we're taught to think is to implicate ourselves in a field ahead of time, right? So like usually when you read a book um, like written by like a philosopher or a theorist, even the most radical of them, they'll spend their introduction being like, this is the whole field I'm part of in advance. So they'll declare their friends and their enemies in advance and then they'll start, right? And in, when you're really sitting with Saeed, you can start seeing the fucked upness of that, right? That entire way of sort of approaching a thought, right? But Saeed is doing something different, which is that he lays out his argument in section one, right? And at the end, after he's laid out his argument, then he incorporates the theory of Michel Foucault. And he says, the stuff that Michel Foucault is talking about, I am turning that to be about what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? It's not that he hasn't read Foucault. He's read him very closely. And so this is like very interesting, right? Because um, my, one of my mentors, who was Saeed's student, um, always points this out. That like, people would always critique Saeed for having like lazily or incorrectly engaged with Western thinkers. And he would always just apparently be like, what the fuck are you saying? Like, I've obviously read all these people. It's clear. I'm just choosing to not engage with them because I don't want to. Or I'm choosing to engage with them in my own way. Right? And in the case of Foucault, as I, I think I talked about this when we went over it last time, in the case of his, the way he incorporates Foucault in here, He's gotten criticism still to this day. People are feeding their families. They have careers off of writing books about how Saeed has incorrectly used Foucault, <laughs> right? Because he didn't take him seriously enough. But actually, in the previous book, Beginnings, which is about this thick, he spends about 100 pages talking about Foucault, right? But so what you see is that this isn't really a critique that is objective or has any sort of ethics behind it, but it's really reinscribing this sort of system of value where Saeed has to constantly prove his allegiance to these Western thinkers. But instead, he's not really interested in doing that, right? What he's doing instead is he understands this thinker deeply, but this thinker is not, he doesn't want to like speak within him, right? He wants to sort of turn him to talk about what he's talking about. And so that's what he does. At the end of his first section, after he said what he wants to say, he says, and for my readers who might be reading this by, by way of an investment in sort of philosophical truth, right? By way of an investment of sort of the production of knowledge in the academy or whatever. You might find this familiar because Foucault talks about something similar. And the shit that he's talking about called a discourse, I'm talking about as Orientalism. And that's how he kind of closes out his first section. And so then we see that he does it again, where he then he says what he wants in his second section. And he then shifts to another very important Western thinker on power, who is Gramsci, at the end of this section. And so it's a way of kind of approaching thought, I think, that is doing the thing that I just talked about with Huri Abutelja's work, right? Putting white people in their place alongside us, which is the most insulting thing that you can do for them. You know what I mean? In a sense, but it's actually the most respectful thing you can do to them in another sense, in the most important sense. Right? Um, okay. And so now I'm going to kind of use, go through this piece by piece. That's the first thing that I thought of, is the way that he kind of wraps, weaves these into his arguments. So let's see how he introduces this. Gramsci has made, and I've never read Gramsci, so like... I've read, you know, the selections that you would read here and there, but I've never, like, sat down and read him, like I'm reading Saeed, for example. So I'm doing the best I can here, but I have my own limitations. So if someone has read Gramsci and you're reading this and you feel that I've incorrectly characterized him, feel free to reach out to me. I'm interested in learning. One day I'll read Gramsci and then I'll go back and read this book again. Um, and it'll be different, I'm sure. Um, Gramsci has made the useful analytic distinction between civil and political society in which the former is made up of voluntary or at least rational and non-coercive 
affiliations like schools, families, and unions, the latter of state institutions, the army, the po police, the central bureaucracy, whose role in the polity, polity is direct domination. Okay, so let's um, map out how Saeed is, is sort of recapitulating Gramsci. Welcome to the stream, y'all. Hold up. All right. Um, on the one hand, we have a sort of, this is in Saeed's reading of Gramsci, right? On the one hand, we have a civil society which is made up of, in Saeed's terms, and we're going to do these lists like we would in other words, but now he's listing on behalf of someone else, so it's interesting, right? Schools, families, unions, the ladder right here, the ladder, which is political society, Army, police, central bureaucracy. Okay. So let's keep these here for a sec. And this, the role of, in the, of this aspect is direct domination, right? Culture, of course, is to be found operating within civil society, this side where the influence of ideas and institutions and of other persons works not through domination, but what Gramsci calls consent. In any society, not totalitarian then, certain cultural forms predominate over others, just as certain ideas are more influential than others. Okay, the form of this cultural leadership is what Gramsci has identified as hegemony, an, an, indispu an indispensable concept for any understanding of cultural life in the West. Okay. So how is Saeed char char uh, characterizing hegemony here? Let's see. So first of all, the first thing that I want to do is to kind of compare... Oh, I froze again. So hold up. All right, y'all. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, I'm gonna restart my computer, and I'm gonna just see what happens. Okay, so I'll.